Well, welcome. welcome. Yeah. So glad you guys are with us today. If we haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Randall. And my name is Becca, and we are so glad that you are here with us this weekend. It's kind of a big weekend for a it's lot a, of different reasons. It's a big weekend. Yeah, a yeah. lot going on. Yeah. Um, but one of the big things that we have going on is it's the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Yeah, you know, 20 years. I, I, you know, the question that we ask every, you know, September 11th is like, where were you, mm -hmm. right? And as somebody just mentioned uh, uh, just recently, like, you know, if you're not 20 years old, right, then you weren't, you have no frame of reference. You hey. just hear, hear those stories. Or actually, even if you're probably 25, right, if you were young, even but for those of us who were um, a little bit older like we know right where we were when the news came yeah and it we were also talking about the fact that like how much technology has changed and really and truly yeah. like what we didn't have footage of before but we were still able to capture some really impactful imagery from that yeah. day but I think that all leads us to remember things in a really, really important and special way. And yeah. we did something this week to celebrate that and to remember and thank our first responders who attend and serve at the crossing. Yeah, so Friday evening, we had a, just a really special um, dinner and evening with a whole bunch of our first responders who either work the weekends at all of our campuses or who, and some who even attend the crossing. We weren't able to do everybody, but we just had a, an amazing evening. Uh, our Pastor Greg was there and Pastor Anthony were there uh, just to celebrate our first responders and their spouses or their significant others uh, and just to encourage them and just to spend an evening with them. So the, the pictures that came out of that and just the stories um, of significance that were there uh, just as in a small way for us to hopefully encourage and champion uh, our first responders who we love so, so dearly, who serve in just um, remarkable, remarkable ways. Yeah, you can see them all over the buildings, whether it's on the weekends or even during the week, but they give so much. And um, you got to do something really cool this week. Yeah, so for those of you who are in St. Louis, I don't know, I didn't see how long it's going to be there, but if you go to Forest Park on Art Hill, there's 7,300 and some odd flags that are there. Um, a flag for each um, first responder or service member who has passed away in active duty since 9-11 um, over the past 20 years. So uh, you probably can't see that, but there's 7,000 flags right there. And it was each flag had the dog tag and the photo of that service member or that first responder. And we took our family there and it was just very moving to see all of those and just to be able to read a little bit about and see some of the faces of people who serve our country and who serve us uh, in ways that uh, I and my, my family are just incredibly grateful for. Absolutely. So if you're in St. Louis, again, I don't know how long it's gonna be there, but it is absolutely worth the trek down to, uh, to Forest Park. It is, it is remarkable. So yeah. check that out. Absolutely, and you're gonna hear more about 9-11 in the service. Greg's gonna talk a bit more about that, but the other big thing going on this weekend is our two years in the making baptism. That's right, so uh, this is our baptism celebration weekend, and we could not be more excited about this. We are ready to celebrate with a couple of hundred people who will be taking that next step in, into the waters of, of baptism. They've made that, that personal decision to follow Jesus, and now they're taking that next step to go public with their faith in an act of obedience with, with baptism. And again, we are so very, very excited about that. Yeah, and one of the ways that we wanted to kind of prep everyone's hearts, not just those who are entering into the water and those who are going to be serving and working there, but was to remind us of like what our baptism was like. So on social yeah. earlier this week, we asked for pictures of you at your baptism. So we've got a short little video kind of showcasing some of those photos so you can see how baptism has evolved over the years. Yeah. So watch this. <laughs>
So, yeah. Randall, I have a question. Yes. Do you remember your baptism? I, I do. I was in third grade, and uh, we lived in Kansas City at the time. My dad was on staff. He was a, the, the worship pastor, worship leader at the church, and he was actually able to baptize me. Um, and so I, re I remember that day um, in the baptistry. I didn't have a photo to add because I don't know if I have a photo of that. And if we do, I don't know, I don't know where it is. <laughs> um, but no, absolutely I do. It was a, a, just a really important day for me that I still remember. What about you? Yeah, I was seven years old. I was at McCready Methodist. It was actually the uh, church that my mom grew up in. And so my grandparents were there, my mom and her siblings were there. And it was just really, really impactful just because there was so much history in that church. And I still go to that church when I go up to the farm on weekends. So it's definitely brings back a lot of memories. Yeah. So um, if you were baptized, um, I just encourage you to tell your story with somebody uh, about when, when it was that, that you stepped into the waters of baptism. If it was at a pond or a baptismal in the church or whatever that, whatever that looked like for you, um, just tell that story. Um, you'll be hearing a lot of stories today uh, when it comes to the people that are walking into the, the the waters of baptism uh, right now, yep. and uh, I hope that it just is just good for your heart because uh, this is just going to be a remarkable time. Right, um, and these stories prepare our hearts, but there's a lot of extra work that has yeah. to go on to actually pull this whole thing off. So yeah. from draining the pond this week, you said there was a lot of work happening on that. Yep to having a whole team of staff who actually tries to figure out where everyone's going to go, in what line, what pastors they're getting baptized yeah. by, reading through all the stories. We saw that picture of Judy last weekend. Right. And there's a lot, but we should probably just show you what that actually looks like so you have a better idea of it. Yeah. work, Randall. Yeah. You guys were real busy. And we didn't even show all of the things. Like our prayer team came on Thursday night and just prayed over everything and prayed over all of the names and other teams that were working really hard to just make sure everything just happens and and that it's an amazing evening of, of, of celebration. So I don't know what you're doing, um, but I would change your plans. Uh, yes. to make sure that you are here. Um, there's lots of details. Again, you'll hear more about the, the actual details of the day in the service, but you can see like the food trucks are here around 3.30 or so. Baptisms start at 5 o'clock p.m. So do whatever you need to do. But again, Sunday evening is just going to be an amazing, amazing evening. It really is, but you shouldn't listen to us uh, yeah, because no. really there's a more impactful person who is here with us today. Um, special correspondent Banyan is here to really just encourage you to make plans for tomorrow night. Hello, this is the Good News Broadcast reporting live. I'm your host, Banyan Crammel, and we are at the Crossing Church in Chesterfield. And this is the Pond of Baptism. And this is where we'll have baptism. Oh, I'm so happy, even my shoes fell off. And I hope you all are happy at home. And you can bring your friends, bring your family, bring all those people. And while you're here, you might even uh, know someone that's getting baptized. So, and if you're getting baptized, good for you. This is the Good News Broadcast. Hope wins. 
I am so happy my shoes fell off too, Banyan. Like, I, I cannot wait for Sunday evening just to celebrate um, all what God's doing and the stories of redemption and the stories of that that people uh, of the people that are just stepping into those into those waters. Yep, and we've actually got stories today, but kind yeah. of prep you for service. So um, David Cording is here actually to share some of those. So I'm gonna hop off as yeah. some of those details come up behind us, and you guys can listen in. Yeah, David, so we've talked about this the past handful of weeks now. We've been telling some of these stories, talking yeah. about some of these quotes, but really those are the things that really do fuel us as a staff and as pastors. So you came with a handful of like just like little, not even the full stories, right? No. Like just little quotes no. of, of the people that are walking through the, bap through the waters of baptism. Yeah, well, and, and, and it's something that we always talk about. The, the whole, I think it's really important just to hear the stories of people who are walking with waters of baptism, even for us who are watching, because it's not just about celebrating, it's about celebrating the steps that they're taking. And so it's really cool just to hear their, their words. So let, with that, with, without further ado, let me just read a few of these. Um, we got Michelle from Chesterfield and she says, I trust in Jesus to lead me, love me, and forgive me for my sins, even though I'm not deserving. And while none of us are, it's really cool that she's saying those things. Um, you got Beth from Fenton. Jesus is the place that was, uh, the, the piece that was missing um, and the one I had been searching for my whole life. You got Amy from Mid Rivers. I love Jesus with all of my heart and my soul and have no problem, problem shouting it out from the rooftop or the baptism pond. Yeah. Um, and then you got Bill uh, from Grants Trail. Baptism is obedience and I want to obey. Um, you know, and those are adults that, that we kind of heard from. But, you know, it's actually really cool just to hear a little bit of, of what our kids are, are saying as well. Because, honestly, um, you know, they don't hold back. And it's yeah. really cool to hear what they have to say. So uh, these are just a few from our, you know, one from one of our staff uh, uh, kids and then a few from our core volunteers. So, uh, Emma, we got, I, I feel like I can tell Jesus anything more so than when I was little. Oh, Emma, you're still our little. She's still kind of little, but you but know what? I think at the same time, it's really cool just to yeah. hear her being able to verbalize those things. And then you got Quinn, um, who is the daughter of one of my volunteers in Youth Crossing. And uh, just to say it, what she has to say, uh, she says, I asked Jesus into my heart, and now it's my job to tell others about him. And you need to know that her dad is, is very much like that too, just wants to share and tell other people about Jesus. And so way to go. It's cool to see how that legacy is, you know, yeah. kind of keep going. So uh, Sydney says, I was with my family in the car one day and I realized I trust Jesus. I decided that th uh, then that he is and will be my forever friend. You got Graham, I'm getting baptized because Jesus did and I should follow what Jesus does. Yeah, I love that. I love that those those kids crossing um, little little quotes are again, like you said, from some of our staff kids and some of our core volunteer kids. Because to me, that just kind of speaks to legacy yeah. and just what God's doing in the lives of our families. Yeah. So um, again, there's there's a whole lot of stories. Those are just some some quotes from some of the people that are walking in the waters. So just in case you, you're not quite sure about the, about the process, you know, can you just show up and get baptized? It's like, no, like there's a little bit of a process. We want to get to know who you are and to hear your story. Right. Um, and to make sure that you know what's going on with baptism, what baptism is and isn't. And so, so we get to read a lot of these stories of people walking in and just to kind of see and hear what God's doing in their life. So it's a really, really cool um, uh, process to be a, to be a part, well, and we don't want anybody to take a step that they're not ready to take. Right, and so part of that is is to help uh, them process that decision of why they're taking baptism, and so it's really cool to just be a part of that. Yeah, so again, normally you know we have our baptism celebration in June uh, because of the reality of the world. We had to push that, and now it's here we are in September. So it's been a year and a half. We've missed yeah. a couple of June baptisms, and so we're really excited about. Uh, about this because it's been a while so it will do your heart good to make sure that you are uh, here and a part of that we just wanted to give you a couple of those quotes you'll hear more stories in the auditorium so that way you you'll know some of the people who are walking in those waters so yeah. 
David, thanks for being here. Thanks Absolutely. for telling us some of the stories. Definitely. So again, um, Sunday night, uh, the details, uh, you'll, again, we're going to keep telling you these because if you're like me, you need to hear it several times, but food trucks will be here. The reason we have those is because it kind of spans over dinner. That yes. way you don't have to worry about that, but you're welcome to bring food if you want, uh, bring a lawn chair, bring a blanket to, to kind of spread out around the pond so that you can um, just be a part of somebody's celebration. Absolutely, but Randall, I have a question for you. Yeah. How do you prepare for baptism every year? So, so for me, and I know that several of our pastors, uh, one of the things that I get to do is I get to see those, um, those like we just, Dave and I were talking about, those applications that mm -hmm. come through so that I get to read those stories and I see the names of the people who are going to be in, in the line that I'm a part of uh, and being a part of this baptism. So I get to know those people and what God's doing in their life. And so, again, the stories that we just, those little blurbs and the stories that you'll hear, like that's how I prepare is just to kind of familiarize myself with, with those stories. And so. what I love about that is it is personal, even yeah. though it feels really big you all know people's stories. Yep. So in just a moment here, we are going to be heading into the auditorium. But if you need anything at all, just reach out in the chat or you can always email pastors at thecrossing.church. We are so glad that you're here with us this weekend and we cannot wait to celebrate baptism. I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear a starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down, come on, brothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, fathers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, fathers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. As I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, mothers, let's go down, let's go down, don't you want to come down? Come on, mothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sinners, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sinners, let's go down, down to the river to pray. I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way.
Welcome to our baptism celebration weekend. We have a lot to celebrate because God is at work in this church and he is changing lives. Every single story, every single person stepping into that water, that is a life transformed by Jesus. So I think we have a lot to give thanks, right? You guys think that? All right, we have a lot of reasons to thank God this weekend. So how about you all stand up, keep worshiping with us. Let's thank God together right now. Put your hands together. Let's worship tonight. Oh, I'm wandering into the night. I'm wanting a place to hide this weary soul. This bag of bones. Points hey. I try with all my might. But I just can't win the fight. Why don't you all have a seat? You're like, where's that voice coming from? I'm over here. So um, where are you going, Mel? Come on. Um, it's okay to dance at this church. Um, here's what I would say to you. We have so much to thank God for uh, today. And I, okay, you're starting. 
you're starting. Um, I'm just looking for some place I can put things. Is there like something here? Does, does anybody, do I look lost? Because I'm a little bit lost right now. Um, I know we've got one of those. Uh, you know what? I'll just come over here. Uh, I'm just so grateful for, for what, we're, what we're experiencing together. And, and I want you to know this much as, as we go through uh, the rest of our time together, we are going to celebrate. And, and uh, our pastors have already told us that because we have over... Let's just say well over 200 folks are going to be somewhere between 200 and 250 people that'll be stepping into the, the waters of baptism this year. And I just want you to know that's a big deal. That's a big deal. In fact, it's such a big deal that, that we want to give thanks. It, it, it's worth giving thanks. Amen? Okay, see, now this is good because at least here, and I know it's at the site, you guys are already used to your, your kind of talking to me, which is cool because this is a day where I'm going to encourage you to talk back to me. Amen? Okay, yeah, now some of you are like already freaked out. We're going to come back to that word, amen. It's a thoroughly biblical word. We're going to rejoice. That's a good word. Like, like look at what it says in Romans chapter 12. It says, for we will rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. There it is. The brutal honesty of scripture. <laughs> it's there. We're going to celebrate. We are going to rejoice. But the word tells, that there, tells us that there will also be moments when we will face tribulation. We will face heartache. We will face these heartaches and these moments of loss. And around here, it seems like we are constantly admitting that we are in the presence of both at the same time. Is anyone else noticing that? We're going to celebrate like nobody's business. And I'm just warning you, I think I'm going to end up telling you more stories today than maybe we've ever told at baptism. I, we need some wins, don't we? I just want you to hear again and again what God is up to. But gang, even while we are so excited about this and we are so ready to celebrate and so ready to do this, and we've been looking forward to this and longing for this because we didn't get to do it last year. We know full well, even while we are here, that we are also celebrating a 20th anniversary of something. So you may not know this, but we have a time of prayer uh, for whoever is coming out and, and, and teaching the word on each weekend. And we have a time of prayer kind of back behind here in this uh, sort of office area back here uh, where the pastors will gather around whoever it is that is teaching. And so we just did that. And I will tell you, I'm, I don't know if you guys felt, it was like... I don't, it was like a Holy Ghost revival happening back there. And let me just tell you what people were admitting. We're going to feel it on both ends of this thing today. We are. We're going to celebrate like you can't imagine. But gang, I think we should stop for just a second. Let me ask it to you this way. It's the way I, I asked it on my social platforms. For those of you who follow me, we've had some interesting uh, responses back on that. But, but it, it, where were you? On September 11th, 2001. Let's go on ahead and say it's a real easy answer for some of you because you weren't at that point. And some of you were so young that you don't even remember, but there's a whole bunch of us of many age groups who can say, I know right where I was, I know right what I was doing. I was honored to be with a, a group of uh, uh, first responders last night at a really important event where we uh, is sponsored by our folks and we, we did this for first responders in the area, law enforcement and firefighters and EMT. And uh, I, I kind of got to the part where I was just talking to all of them and I'll, I'll, <laughs> I won't forget, I looked around the room and said, I'm guessing you guys could always, all of you men and women could tell me where you were and to a person there was just this solemn nodding, we remember. So I asked the folks on our, on, on, on our socials to just get back to me on, on some things. And these were some of the answers that, that, that I just heard, just real quickly. We live by Lampert, and to have no air traffic was the most chilling sound. I was in New Jersey for a job training, and I was about 15 miles from the George Washington Bridge. The world stopped, the train stopped, fighter planes were overhead, smoke was in the distance, and I had a sinking feeling in my stomach until I made it home to St. Louis five days later. In Washington, D.C., I was trying to get a hold of my husband who worked in the Navy Yard. I was teaching kindergarten, wishing I could be watching with the rest of the world, but I was trying to be kind and patient and not show fear to 20 kindergarten children. Thank God for kindergarten teachers. My husband and I realized that his boss and business colleague with whom he'd had dinner the previous evening may be on one of those planes. By the time our evening special service, it was confirmed they were lost on flight 11. 
I was in LA and I was supposed to fly home that morning. I remember the tears rolling down my face as I watched the second tower be struck. I remember the panic of, how am I gonna get home to my family? And then, and this was something that came up again and again and again, a, a, like a surprising unity. Do you guys remember that? You remember when we united around things? This person said, I remember all these people coming together and helping everyone on the road travel back to their homes and prayers and sharing rides. I, I can tell you what I remember on what was a cloudless day here in St. Louis that Tuesday. My girls were getting ready for school, just like many of your kids were getting ready. We watched the news. We're praying. Robin and I are praying because, oh, what a terrible accident. Something has hit the tower, but as we all know, it wasn't an accident. And you remember, it was that sinking feeling of, wait, we're under attack? What did we, what's going on? I remember trying to explain it to little girls who don't know what some of those words mean. I remember gathering with a very small staff because we were a very small church. Do you remember that? We met at Russ Kirkland's uh, living room and as a small staff and we said, what are we gonna do to serve our folks? What are we gonna do to serve first responders in our community who have been rocked by this? How can we move forward? I remember gathering in the evening at the little community theater attached to Chesterfield YMCA because that's where we met. We had to get permission. Can we come and have the, the, the room that night? And we gathered and we prayed and we thought and we, we, we grew and we worshiped and then we prayed some more and it kind of started us on a road honestly of continuing to serve and to honor not only our military but those who serve in law enforcement and fire protection and EMTs it really started us on a road and 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 here we are 20 years later and those losses still reach us don't they that day still echoes doesn't it I just want us to acknowledge that. I think the followers of Jesus can do that. We can acknowledge both the rejoicing and the grieving in the same moment. We can do that. I mean, if we're going to be really honest, some of you uh, answered the call and moved into public service, and you are in law enforcement, and you do serve others, and you are in fire protection and EMTs, and we are so grateful. I'll go a little bit further, though. There were some kids who were in school that day, third graders, fourth graders, fifth graders, who grew up and actually served in the military in the war that resulted from that day. How does that happen? And the losses still touch us. I'm thinking of Lance Corporal uh, Schmitz, who was accompanied by many of our crossing riders this week, who honored him in a spectacular motorcade as they took the body from the airport to a funeral home in St. Charles County. So what do we do? That's the question. I say we remember. Let's remember. Let's remember those who served and those who, who, who were lost. Let's remember people who were running into the buildings while everybody else was running out. Let's remember, families, that today it's going to feel like an open wound again. Let's remember those who have chosen to serve us now through seasons of struggle and heartache and difficulty. Because I'll be honest with you, I was in a room of heroes last night, and you and I walk past them every day. Let's remember, let's pray for their families who are carrying these burdens. You see, what I love about that scripture that we looked at a minute ago is that it's you rejoice in hope, you endure in tribulation. But what was the last part? Be constant in prayer. It's what we do. We pray. Listen, God's called us to more than just praying. But I want to let you in on something. Without prayer, what we do won't matter to as much as we want it to. So now let's pray. Let's remember, even as we rejoice, even as we endure times right now that are difficult for us. But let's pray because I believe there is one whom we can trust. I believe there is one whose mercies are new every morning. I believe there is one who is steadfast and pure and faithful. And I do thank God. But right now, what I'd love for us to do, uh, Ben, if you would, before we kind of move back into a time of prayer. Would you pray for us as God leads you for our country, for these people who are serving, for those who are feeling these losses? Would you pray for us, please? I'd love to. Lord Jesus, thank you, God, for this opportunity to remember. <laughs> to remember that even though there is evil in this world, even though there is tribulation in this world, God, evil doesn't have the last word. Jesus, you do. 
And God, we remember that even now you are the God who is with us. And you say at the end of Matthew's gospel, you will never leave us nor forsake us. God, that is a promise that we can hang on to. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you fall into this room. God, will you move in close? Will you move in closer than close? Will you comfort those who are hurting? Will you bring peace to those who feel anxious, God? Will you remove fear if people are afraid? God, I do thank you for the servicemen and women, the brave people that protect our country, for firefighters, for police officers, God. Please keep them safe. Lord, we do trust in you. And we do look forward to the day that you will return and right all wrongs and make everything right. But until that day, God, We remember your goodness. We remember your faithfulness. Jesus, tis so sweet to trust in you. We trust. We trust. And we ask all of these things in your name. Lamentations 3, it's a book of lament. Lamentations 3 says this, in the middle of a really tough moment where the writer is just admitting how hard it is, he says, this I will call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Do you believe that? If you believe that, I'm going to ask you to stand with me right now, because his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. And the people of God all together said, amen. God of covenants and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you said. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to Is your faithfulness to me? Sing it again. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun. From the rising sun to the setting sun, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness. Oh 
Jesus, God, thank you. Thank you that no matter, no matter what storms we face in this life, God, you are bigger than the storm. You are great as your faithfulness. So God, move in close. Continue to speak to us. Continue to reveal to us who you are. We ask this all in the name of Jesus, our risen King, we ask these things. Amen. All righty, if you are worshiping here at Chesterfield, feel free to take a seat and say hello to someone around you. Say hello, yeah. All right, so raise your hand if you've attended one of our baptism celebrations before. All right, that's a good bit of people, all right? So you guys will probably know all this, but I want to speak to the people that have never been. I'm going to invite my friend Natalie. She's going to come up here, and we're going to go over just some last-minute baptism details that you might want to know. So, yes. Natalie, baptism, it's a little bit different this it's a little year, bit different. yeah? So in the years past, it's been in June. For those of you who raised your hand, you know that, but... Which it's not June it's right not now. It's not June. Okay, it's, it's September. Good. And the sun usually sets like a couple hours later, but this, this time around, it's a school night, so we've bumped the timeline up. Just a tad. Yep. Baptisms will actually start at 5 p.m. normally at 6.30. But it starts at 5, but there's some pretty good reasons why people are going to yes. want to get here there's early, right? There's a lot of reasons. Right? There's yeah. a lot of reasons. Yeah. Good parking. If you need assistance to the pond, I would encourage you to get here early. We Which we have golf. people to help with that, yes. right? We have yeah. golf carts that will be all around the parking lot to help you. But my reason is the food trucks. Food, you, okay, you had me at food trucks. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Yeah, so we, we love, um, we invite food trucks every year because yeah. we want to give people an opportunity. Yes, it's a very holy moment, but it's also a celebration. Yeah, yeah. we want to celebrate, and it's around dinner time, right? So we right. want to make sure people right. have food. So I think the list is up there. What yeah. are you going to get? So I am a, I'm a huge chicken wing fan, so like... That wing nut truck, yeah. like I am all about that yeah. life. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. But if none of that sounds appealing, you're welcome to bring your own food. Tell them a few more things yeah. that they could bring. Yeah, bring your own food if you want to do that. It's going to be kind of hot, so bring some water, maybe some sunscreen, some bug spray. If you want to bring a chair to sit on or a blanket, blanket to sit yeah. on. I've had a couple of people ask if they can bring pop-up tents because it, it will be a little bit warm. You are welcome to. We just ask you to kind of stay away, you know, a little bit farther back so we don't block people's view. A yeah. couple things maybe to leave at home. Um, we are big dog lovers. We are. We are, but leave your pets at home. And also, um, we just ask that you leave alcohol at home. We just want to make it a safe and welcoming yeah. place for everybody. It, it really is about creating a safe place for mm -hmm. people to come and experience what Jesus is doing in our midst. And really, that's what we try to do each and every weekend, to have a, a safe place for people to come and experience the grace of our King. So that wouldn't be possible without the generosity of, of you guys just faithfully giving each and every weekend. So for those of you who do that, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, in that spirit, we're gonna move into a, a time to take our tithes and offerings. The way to give will be on the screen behind me. If you're worshiping here at Chesterfield, you can drop your gift off in the boxes around. Uh, if you're still, still trying to figure out who God is, feel free to take a pass on this part of the service. We just hope that you'll join us tomorrow night to celebrate this 220 plus ish, yeah, ish yeah. plus people who are That's coming to step into the waters of baptism. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Let's just pick this thing back up, and, and let me just tell you that Ernest Hemingway wrote a short story called The Capital of the World, and the opening line of the story is, Madrid is full of boys named Paco. 
And you think it's a strange name. He's kind of just talking about how many kids there are named Paco. And then he refers to a joke that he says is making the rounds in Madrid about this forlorn father who is trying to find his son, but he can't find him. And so he posts an advertisement in the local newspaper. It reads as such, Paco, meet me at the Hotel Montana Tuesday at noon. All is forgiven. Papa. And the rest of the story is the next day they had to disperse the, they had to assemble the, the National Guard to disperse like over 800 young men who had gathered at the Hotel Montana. Now this is just a story and it's just a, a, he says a joke that was making the rounds in Madrid, but he missed the point. He thought the joke was that there are so many young men named a certain name. I'm telling you the point of that, that story is that there are young men and women and not so young men and not so young women who long to know that they can be forgiven, who long to know that it's okay to come home. And that's what we're talking about today. That's where all of this is heading. And it really takes us back to the story that we were in. Uh, boy, that was two weeks ago. It seems so long ago, but it was two weeks ago when, when we began to experience, I think, something extraordinary that our team put together. And uh, it's just it was just so, so good. And I, I want us to understand today as we move forward that this is still our story. It's still your story. If you came here today and this is like your first visit, you're watching online for the first time, or you just kind of jumped on board with us maybe in the summer, I want you to hear as loudly and as clearly as I can say, it is not too late for you to come home. You're going to hear stories now, like I said, at the level that maybe we've not told before, but this is is for you. We're going to intersperse it with, with scriptures and it's not too late to be forgiven. It's not too late. Now, some of you have known Jesus for a long time, and I want you to hear, this story is for you, and these stories are for you, and it's not too late for you to come back and to realize how much you are loved by your Heavenly Father. You see, I think for some of us who have known Jesus for a long time, it's quite possible that we've grown tired, or maybe even cynical. Can we say that? Some of us, the the world's cynicism has kind of caked onto our souls, and we find ourselves saying cranky things these days we never would have said five years ago get it. It's wearing us down. In fact, some of you are thinking, okay, so when are we going to have one of those talk to your neighbors moments? Because that's when I make a break for it. I don't need to hear these rah, rah stories about Jesus today. That's going to be your first clue that maybe instead lean in. See, I'm going to ask you, if you would, to just stay with us for a minute, because if you've ever been disconnected, if you've ever felt like you live in a far off land, if you've ever felt discontented or discouraged, if you're feeling sort of empty now, or maybe you're just tired, or maybe, how about this, you're wondering if God is still at work in this world. Today is for you. We are now going to tell stories of people who have come back to a father that loves them. One more time, 1 John 3, verse 1, see what grace love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Heavenly Father, we come before you now. We pray that as we tell these stories and open your word, that you will speak to each of us, God, that you will get past the defenses and the discouragement. God, that you'll get past the distractions. Father, some of us need this so badly our hearts are hurting. Some of us are going to blow right past this because we don't even know how much we need this. But God, there are many in our midst who could not wait for this weekend. So together now, speak to us one more time. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. In case you're not getting the point, let me just say one more time. There are two words that I think uh, are so halting and so meaningful when they are put together that uh, whether you see it on a, on a, on like a poster in a backyard or on a front porch whether you see it on a homemade sign in the middle of the airport. This idea of being welcomed home, I just just gotta tell you, this this is where we left things at Luke chapter 15. There is this father who could not and would not give up on his rebellious kid. So remember, he's constantly checking the the horizon. He's constantly looking. He would not give up on him. He was so eager to forgive. And then he sees him in the far off distance. And if you'll remember, he doesn't walk. He runs. He's trying to outrun the shame. He's trying to outrun those who are coming ahead from from the village. He runs ahead, filled with compassion. He ran to his son, verse 27. 
says. He threw his arms around him. He's kissing him. He's, he's just welcoming his home. The son starts to confess that he has sinned. He starts to try to come up with this half-baked plan of, I think I can earn my way back into a relationship with you. I'll work it off. Maybe at the very least, I can earn some of your favor back. The father will have none of it. He interrupts the rehearsed speech and he says, quick, bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And so they began to celebrate. Gang, I just want us to be really clear before I start reading stories. This is why we celebrate. There are sons and daughters who have come home. Is it going to be different this year? Yeah, it will look a little different. But we're not going to stop. And we're not going to back up. We are going to celebrate with these people who are proclaiming the relentless pursuing love of God. We don't have a fatted calf that we've killed. But as you've already heard, we've got food trucks. (laughs) And we've got music. And we've got celebration, and now we have stories galore of a father who doesn't give up on his kids. Let me just start off with some of these now. Um, and along the way, I'll just, I'll just give you some, uh, some, some themes that I see that are, that are happening a- along the way. This is a, uh, this is a uh, 20-something young man. He says, uh, somewhere in high school, God began to reveal to me that apprenticeship and discipleship to Jesus requires commitment and relationship. There's a real depth to this, his description. He says, because of the relentless pursuit and love that God poured onto me, I began to change. You see, the reason we're doing this is because sons and daughters are coming home. He has, and, and by the way, I hope the rest of us have never forgotten what it's like to be welcomed home. Here's a 40-something woman. She says, I was raised in a certain denomination. I attempted to follow all of the rules, and in looking back, I, what I was trying to do was to prove myself worthy of God's love and acceptance. You see, it's not just the kid in the story. We all fall into this trap of thinking, I bet I can work my way out of it. I lack the tools to cope. I found myself in a deep hole. I had no idea how I'd gotten into it. I was an alcoholic. Through a series of events, I found a program that would teach me how to live one day at a time. As part of that program, I needed to rely on a power greater than myself. I did this. I began to pray to a God of my understanding, but there was still a spiritual void inside of me. It was desperate to find more. In addition to getting sober, I wanted to learn of life that included worship and community. And I wanted, how about this, a relationship with Jesus that was unshakable. So a neighbor invited me to a Sunday service. Immediately, I felt God embrace me. And Jesus said to me, you have come home. You are safe. You are loved. She said, I spent the next three to four uh, services just weeping as tears coming down my face, purging all of the built up fear and anxiety and toxic thinking. But Jesus welcomed me home and has continued to show me grace. Now I want everyone to know that I am with him. That's exactly right. I want everyone to know that I am with him. This ancient, beautiful practice of baptism, it, it's, not what, it's not what changes someone standing with a holy God. It is what tells the watching world that we are with Jesus. It is what tells the story that has happened, the twist in the plot, the, 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 the newness of life, being raised... Uh, back to life in some ways. It's a picture, this is a drastic picture of what it means to be cleansed, thoroughly forgiven. That's what this is. And just so we're clear, people of all ages get this. See, I want you to understand, I'm going to try to do this, my desk here is very tiny, so, uh, uh, but like one of the themes that that you see here is that uh, kids Maybe as many kids as we've ever had, certainly as many as we have ever had percentage-wise, kids are being baptized. You think about the season they've been through. Children are coming to Christ. Now, before you go, I bet they don't know what they're talking about. These kids have to articulate their faith. They have to be able to share this with one of our leaders. And there are times, and our children's leaders will back me up on this, where we lovingly tell a child and their parents, not yet. Let's wait until you completely have this fully just locked in and we'll make it a gorgeous, beautiful moment when it happens. But I'm telling you, these kids know what they're talking about. Here's what the way a fifth grade boy puts it. Jesus is God's son. He died to take away all our sins and forgive us. He forgave me for shooting the hockey puck into my neighbor's garden on accident. <laughs> now listen to me, I just want you to hear this. You don't have to be a grown up for regret and shame to find you. I said I was sorry and that I would try not to do it again. 
and I asked him to forgive me. And he did. While having a baptism conversation with a third grade boy, this is one of our kids pastors, he was nervous and struggling a bit to talk about the meaning of baptism. So I asked him to pretend that I was a third grade boy in his class who knows nothing about baptism. How would he explain baptism to his friend? I told Lori when I read this, brilliant, just a brilliant way to get a child to start talking to you. Here's what he said. And I quote, well, you see, there's this guy named Jesus. Pause. He's not just any guy. Pause, serious looking, serious thinking look on his face. He's the son of God. He died on a cross so that I could be forgiven. So I'm getting baptized to celebrate what he's done for me. Any questions, grown-ups? Because I'm going to tell you what, this goes on again and again and again. I, 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 we, we can keep going with this, but uh, let me, do, let me do, another theme that we saw were, were teenagers. Uh, David, we were talking about this earlier in the week, the, 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 just the, the depth of the way that teenagers are explaining their faith and how this is going through. Let me just give you a couple of these really quickly. Uh, when I was in the sixth grade, I started to get to know God. I went to winter blast, big theme, winter blast. And on the last night, I really felt like God was standing there with me. It was the last night of camp. We were worshiping and I actually felt his love. It was such an amazing moment. I don't even know how to explain it. I was ready to get baptized. But COVID hit, and I didn't get to do it. Ever since then, I have grown even closer to God by joining the youth band, by going to summer camp, by attending church on the weekends and youth in the middle of the week. Fast forward to now, baptism is happening again, and I finally get to do it. Here's a 16-year-old who said, my life was pretty normal until my freshman year of high school. I started becoming anxious about all sorts of things. I doubted that I had a purpose in this life, and I compared my life to others. I began to have breakdowns almost every night and I developed symptoms of obsessive compulsive disorder and I quickly became trapped in an ungodly in ungodly and intrusive thoughts. She said these thoughts began to 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 make me doubt whether God could even love me. I mean, how could he love me after everything I was thinking and everything I had done? This is a 16-year-old She goes on to say that God does love her and she knows now that God loves her. She said freshman year was rough, but God has been good. I just want to remind anybody who goes through the same thing not to listen to the devil's lies. They're not from God. You need to know that you have a purpose on this earth and that you are loved. What does baptism mean to her? Baptism is telling the world that I am putting my faith in Jesus. I get to tell my story to the world and maybe impact somebody's life. You never know what somebody else is going through. Baptism is a way of turning from your past and letting it die. And when you come out of, up out of the water, it symbolizes a new life with Jesus. I'm telling you, this is thick theology. She and the Apostle Paul could sit down and they would have a good conversation. I'm telling you, there are people who are coming to Christ at a variety of ages, and uh, it's not just them. Can I just go on ahead and say here, it's 20-somethings and 30-somethings. Without going into the statistics of it all, the vast majority of our people who are being baptized tomorrow are under the age of 40. Most of them are teenagers, 20-somethings, 30-somethings. Do you understand how countercultural that is? I don't know that you do because this would be a place where you would be talking back to me because I'm telling you right now, every expert is saying it doesn't happen with 20-somethings. It doesn't happen with 30-somethings. It doesn't happen with teenagers, but they are coming to Christ. Here's a 20-something who said, someone at the crossing actually helped lead my older brother, a longtime skeptic, to the Lord. So it will always hold a special place in my heart. Jesus found me when I was the most broken I've ever been. Before quarantine... Yeah, we probably need to go on ahead and write that down because it's a theme. We've already heard it. But that word's all over these stories. Before quarantine, I was a heavy drinker, partier, and had just gotten out of a bad relationship. I was insecure and looking for love in places I shouldn't have been. You need to know we have permission to share all these stories. I'm not, I'm not giving you names, but we have permission, Okay. This led me to ultimately making one of the worst decisions of my life, which ended up me being violated in the worst possible way. This showed me the depth and truth of rock bottom and how no human could ever satisfy the deep longings inside of me. And then these words, thankfully, quarantine happened. Listen to me. 
what evil meant for harm, God can take and twist it around. He's doing it all the time. She says, it allowed me to do some soul searching and I began to seek Jesus with the support of my loving family. I was listening to a worship song in my car when I finally broke down and asked Jesus to come into my heart. Surrendering everything to him has been the most freeing thing I have ever done. Here's a 20-something who said, when COVID hit, I knew my excuse of never having enough time was no longer a valid excuse. I spent weeks hiding away and reading most of the Bible. Can I just tell you, over and over in these stories, what we hear is that people are reading scripture. It was the power of God's word that was drawing them to him. Come on. I felt like it was almost now or never. I was either going to fall back into old temptations or completely surrender and give my life over to Christ. I chose the latter. It was almost like I had no choice once I felt his undeniable love and grace in his presence. Gang, these are stories that are dripping with resurrection power. Amen? Now, let's just go back to this word amen because I'm having to coax it out of you. I'm going to write it down because I think it's a theme word here. But the word amen, we've talked about it before. Some of you think it's the period at the end of a, of, a, of a liturgical sentence. And it can be that. It is even that in the scriptures. Some of you think it's just how you end a prayer officially. So that's how you know. That, more importantly, that's how God knows that you've hung up. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I think that's the way some of us think. And for some of us, for some of us, it's just the obligatory, now we can eat. When you hear the amen in the blessing before you eat, now you know it's time to go. Right? Lord, we do, amen, thank you for that. (laughs) Somebody's listening. Lord, we just thank you so much for, uh, for, for, for this bountiful blessing you have given us and for the food that is here and those who have prepared it. All around the table, we all together now say, amen. amen. Junior, pass the taters. I mean, it's just one of those things where it's like you don't even take a breath and you just go. I need you to know that amen is something else. If you begin to study the ancient Semitic languages to which it goes back, like this is maybe the most, one, one researcher said this might be the most used word every day on the planet. Because three world religions use this word every day. Christians, Jews, and Muslims. It is an old, old, old word. If you go way back, maybe like to the Assyrians, we're talking a really ancient language. What it meant, they think, is something that is solid, reliable, and true. And so it came to be this kind of thing of, yes, so be it. That's true. Now, I know some of you think it's saying sick him to Pastor Greg and he's going to break out the tambourine and you get all worried. But I'm telling you, this is a good biblical word and we should be responding to God either in our hearts or out loud with amen when we hear these stories. Let me give you just the next word as we go through this. I think it really honestly is, is the word legacy. That is not very well done. Um, legacy, legacy. We're seeing so many people who are now coming to Christ because their parents came to Christ at this church. Come on. Do you see that's what happens in a church where the faith is passed from generation to generation? Um, my dad started bringing me to the crossing when I was like five or six year old. I didn't understand it at first, but we sang songs, learned lessons from the Bible and it was fun. So I liked it. But when I started having serious questions about Jesus and why we even went to church, my dad and my grandparents were always willing to talk to me about it. Started going to camp each summer and I learned more stories about God's love. What's this camp thing that we keep hearing about? My dad prayed with me about accepting Jesus into my life and I have just trusted that. All my life, I felt like I was missing something, says a 14 year old. And you can kind of giggle and go, wow, 14. No, I'm telling you. My parents introduced me to Christianity at a young age. For the longest time, I felt that I could always just give my life to Jesus later. But I realized that I needed Jesus now. And I felt like I was too young to understand something like God. But then he showed himself to me in small ways. And my faith was sealed. 
I'd always heard stories about people that were uh, made whole by Jesus, and I found my answer. I gave my life to Jesus two years ago at Winter Blast Camp. Sometimes you're a little bit older, and you've kind of given up on all of this because of an experience that you had growing up. This is somebody who says a particular denomination and being forced to go to certain things, and he just said, I, I wanted nothing to do with it. And then I go to college, and I start dating this this young woman and after a while it's serious and I need to meet her parents and so they invited me to lunch one day on a Sunday but then we were going to go to church as well we probably need to go on ahead and talk about this word invite because that's how it happens they were inviting him to church he heard a pastor Tim Bounds preach about the, how it's easier for, for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven and the whole story caught his attention because he said my prized possession was my car that I had since I was 16 and now I want to know more. And he said, I began to understand that I could look at God's word instead of traditions. And along the way, he discovers who Jesus is. And I asked him to save me, saying that I was not enough and I need a savior. Gang, I just want you to hear over and over and over again, this is what it is. Now I'm just going to flood you with some stories. I know I'm moving fast. I think this is going to feel like a fire hose, but I just need you to hear some quotes now. <laughs> These are of all ages. He gave his life for me. I'm giving my life to him. That's what Jerry says. I was with my family in the car one day and I realized I tr really trust Jesus. I decided then that he is and will be my forever friend. Baptism is a representation and symbol of who I am living my life for. The decision to follow Jesus has made a huge impact on my life. I'm able to live more freely and at peace. Gang, without going into great details, I will just say that this dad has experienced the kind of trauma that a parent never wants to imagine. Christ has radically transformed my life and worldview. Through my consumption of scripture over the past 24 months, the simple message of belief, repent, and be baptized became evident. I'm getting baptized, this young man says, because Jesus did, and we should follow what Jesus does. Jesus is the peace that was missing and the one I have been searching for my whole life. And then how about this? To a world screaming a million answers to questions, my answer will always be Jesus. Amen. Amen. Sarah, lead us now. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, and you will be praised. Megan is a 30-something who said I grew up certain denomination, tradition, wasn't really into it. Just before high school graduation, I met my now husband. Uh, he was just different than anybody else I'd hung out with. Uh, he made his faith very clear, and he often invited people to his church, The Crossing. Knowing my background, he assumed I would be a little taken aback considering the loud music and modern take on the message, but he was wrong. I loved it. I couldn't wait to go back. But now watch this. She settles in on this, and she says at one point, a few years later, it all became like a routine to me. 
And it wasn't exactly like getting down into my heart. There were some challenges. There were some beautiful babies that were born. And then this idea of, of anxiety and worry started to kick up. I promise you it is in so many people, so many young people's lives, this worry and this anxiety in this life. And then COVID hits and there's a little one and she's worrying and how is this going to happen? And she said, I found myself not relying or trusting in God. And then during COVID, for all sorts of reasons, she said, I started to pick up my Bible and read again. And I read almost the entire Bible last year. This year, I'm doing the same. And as I began really digging into the word, I can honestly say my trust in Jesus has finally made it from my head to my heart. Baptism to me means showing the world that I am with Jesus and he is with me. Philippians 4 Verses four through seven says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And here it is. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Time and again, people in these stories are saying, I finally found the peace that I was looking for. I finally found the peace. I don't have all the answers. I don't have it all figured out, but there is one who is giving me peace. Um, Here's a 20-something who said, throughout middle school and high school, I, like many others, experienced anxiety and depression and even suicidal thoughts. But as my life was hardened, my faith grew, my connection with Jesus grew, my love for God and grew, and it was this heavenly love that got me through it all. And then he says what I think is an extraordinary thing. This is a 20-something young man who said, as I'm thinking of making this commitment, it began to occur to me as I'm deepening a relationship with a young woman. I want to publicly vow to be loyal and faithful to Jesus before I do that with this young woman. All right, that's who's going to be at the center of that relationship. Here's a, uh, a 40-something woman who, who said, uh, my journey has been more like a roller coaster at times. Um, I always seem to just try to find my own ways. I always knew Jesus was there. My husband had leukemia and I knew God had cured him and was with us every step of the way. And I gave God glory for my husband's help, but I wasn't trusting him. I lost myself in those three years of that difficult time. But then one year ago, during the COVID stay at home order, God urged me to attend a virtual Bible study with my mother of preschoolers group. I kept saying no, and God kept saying yes. Do you see how God is using this last year in a way that none of us expected? I decided to start making the commitment to God, and I surrendered my life to him, and I have asked for his help to live my life, and since then, my relationship with Jesus has never been closer. Uh, just one more. It's been a long journey to become a Christian. Um, one evening before starting college, a man drugged me and sexually assaulted me. I was angry and hurt and I blamed God. How could he let something like that happen to me? I went down a very long path of shame and anger and depression. I made lots of choices that I'm not proud of. And the only person that kept reaching back and pulling me back to God was my mom. She's the strongest believer I have ever known. After 10 years of anger and denial, I love this line, I started to tiptoe my way back to God. I allowed myself to open back up and to let him in. But just as I did this, my mom is diagnosed with an incurable brain cancer. She goes through four years of difficult chemo and operations. Now she dies. At about this same time, she and her husband divorce, and she's left all alone with two kids under the age of four. I am angry at God again. How can this keep happening? I felt disconnected, empty, and lost. But one day of being tired of going through these motions... I felt in my heart there was something more, so I started trying different churches until I was invited to the crossing. My first service, I cried through most of it. The messages connected my life with the word. The, the music made my soul feel alive, and it brought a smile back to my face. I finally realized Jesus wanted me. Trusting in Jesus opened my heart to be joyful and free. Why are you choosing to be baptized? I want to proclaim that I am free. We're right back to the beginning of the service now. I am free. Praise the Lord. I am free. Gang, we could just keep telling you these stories, and I don't want to overwhelm you with any more of them. I will just tell you that there are people who are finding purpose. There are people who truly are uh, coming back home. 
And it really does all come down to, to, to this one person and this one name and this one around who the whole story revolves. You see, there are going to be men and women and, and teenagers and 20-somethings and single moms and single dads and friends and family that are going to be cheering and crying and laughing because they have invited someone into this story, and it's happening. And I will tell you, if you come tomorrow night, it will be a time of, of gratitude. It'll be a time of celebration. It'll be a time of hope. It'll be a time of relief. But I'm going to go on ahead and continue to be real with you. It'll be a time of fatigue. It'll be a time of worry. It'll be a time of aggravation because of whichever way you stand on whatever thing you're arguing with someone about these days. We can't let that happen. God is up to something and we need to reject that and we need to come back to what it is that we will do together. You see, I believe God is up to something in our midst. I believe God is calling us to this. I don't think I ever took our baptisms for granted. I really don't. Every time they were special to me, but I'm going on record. I will never take a baptism around here for granted again. This is a precious moment, and I want you to know God is still up to something, which means some of you need to stay steadfast. One last scripture, 1 Corinthians 15. My dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Let me put it to you this way before we have one last song. All those things that you are doing, all those things that you don't think anybody else even knows about, the prayers that you are praying, the tears that you are shedding, the words that you are carefully choosing, the things that you choose not to say in that moment, in that discussion, the, 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 the ways you serve, the way you forgive, these acts of mercy, the amazing generosity that you show with no strings attached and nobody else even knows that you're doing this. The way that you ruthlessly choose to not have an opinion about everything that is happening in your world. The way it's dialing down your blood pressure. The way that it's giving you a chance to respond kindly and gently instead of returning fire anytime somebody disagrees with you. All of these seem like such little things, but I need you to hear every one of those God is using to further his kingdom. Every one of those acts of obedience God is using to woo somebody and to invite them to consider who this Jesus sees, this, this Jesus is. Every healing act, every good word, every hard moment, every bit of sweat that you have ever shed in helping to restore God's creation that he still loves, I want you to know it will matter. You are, it's, you're not crazy and it has not been done in vain. And in two weeks, we're going to connect some dots of what's happening around here, what's going to happen around here, and we will show you some things. But I will tell you at the end of the end of the end of the story, there will come a time for those of you who follow Jesus when he will show you how everything mattered. These decisions that nobody knew about, these choices and these moments of grace, they all matter. We get glimpses of it now, but you will see someday how Everything you did to pursue Jesus matters. In fact, I'm just going to tell you, the series in October and November, as we humbly open the book of Revelation, you need to be ready because we will not agree on all things, but whoa, we're going to agree on some of the big ones and we're going to agree on the biggest of all. You see, we will not give up and we will not give in because we follow Jesus. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Son of God. He is the Lord of all. He is Rabbi and Master and Savior and Teacher, Messiah. He's the Advocate. He is the Righteous Judge. Yes, He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and He will accomplish His purposes. He is still on the move, and He is still alive in this church. He is the Resurrection and the Life. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the Beginning and the End, and He is worth it all. And I'm going to tell you what, there's over 200 people that are going to step in the water tomorrow and say, I'm with Him to a world that is given Giving up, a world that is curious, a world that is angry, a world that is confused, but they're going to stand up and say they're with Jesus 
and it will be our privilege and honor to stand with them. Don't you think that's worth cheering? Don't you think that's worth laughing and crying and praying? Why? Not because of us, but because Jesus is worthy of all praise and glory and honor. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Count to three and say a prayer Down for love and up for air Underwater overjoy Water for a thirsty soul Water for a thirsty soul Baptize me into your love Oh, the spirits overcome Body, mind, and skin and bone Love, I'm gonna make it known I'm gonna make it known yeah, I'm coming alive with you I'm coming alive with you I was living a lie until you And now I'm coming alive with you All the people say I goodness. I'm going to leave this right here like this. 
And I'm just going to say to you, we hope that you join us. We hope that you'll come back and join us. Thank you for being a part of what God is doing here. We are so grateful to be a part of this. We'll see you tomorrow night. Give it all.